We are so pleased and honored to have Coach Jerry Reynolds with us, synonymous with the Sacramento Kings. Uh, no one is more uh, part of the fabric of the Kings, whether it is uh, the on-court play, the front office, uh, broadcasting, obviously. Um, and as we look back on 2002, which is also semi-depressing when you think, Coach, that the Warriors going back to the finals for the sixth time in eight years and we as the flagship station, I just want to make sure everyone knows how self we're at least self-aware. We, we're doing a two-week retrospective on a year in which we made the Western Conference Finals. We didn't advance. We made it, and it ended in heartbreak. But there's not a lot of not a lot to choose from, so we, we, we get what we choose. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly right. You know, I mean, it's it's what it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I sometimes think, and I know my wife points this out periodically, that I live in the past too much. And I think we all do. If, with the Kings, you don't have much of a choice. Yes. But but I'm ready to I'm ready to move on and, and, and come up with some, some uh, new highlights. Ah. But uh, that was, a, you know, it was a magical time. I mean, it, really, there was a two-year period there where the Kings certainly could have with any breaks at all and yeah. maybe if a little a little honest officiating yeah uh, could have been not only national world champions but maybe twice but you know the the next year uh you know weber's knee injury the team was probably more talented the next year that's, but the, yeah. the weber knee injury ended that i i haven't asked any of our other guests this um for various reasons i i feel like i'm gonna ask you um we had Scott Howard Cooper on last week and he and I kind of got into it a little bit. Like, you know me, I wear my emotions. And, and by the way, I love Scott. It was just a debate. Um, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. I'm a little, uh, emotional, this, that, whatever. I've all, I always felt like there was something really fishy in game six, like wrong in game six, 27 free throws in the fourth quarter for the Lakers. And you know, they've been averaging 20, 22 the whole game, but uh, there's no opinion. I respect more than yours in your heart of hearts. Do you, do you look back at that and think there was something fishy, or do you think the refs just had the worst day of their lives? Well, it it, it really comes down to that because uh, you know you had three quality officials. I know they they really are. They're they're three of the very best that's ever done it. Sure. And and it just so happens mm -hmm. that with three of the very best, they they all uh, had probably the worst quarters of officiating in their history. Yeah. So I, I'm not one to believe in coincidences uh, sure. per se but uh, and i certainly can't prove that there's any collusion or sure, or anything like that but but i do know i've watched that tape enough yeah. to know that there was uh probably 15 18 clearly missed calls that all went one way and we yeah. know that basketball and I, I know this that basketball is impossible to officiate 100 percent correctly of course i mean it just is of course but normally uh you know 18 missed calls well it on a bad day, uh, ten go the other one team's way, and eight right. go the other, as opposed to nine and nine. Right. But eighteen and zero? Oh? No, 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 no. There was, uh, you know, I, I just honestly, I, I, I think the officials personally think the officials knew that the league would like to see a game seven, yep. because the TV ratings were just off the charts. Yes. And uh, and all that, and they and they probably, yeah, you know, Kings are probably going to beat them. Yeah. Which uh, which. Uh, King should have, but should've. they didn't. Yeah. Uh, and I think the hangover from game six had a lot to do with it. I personally do. I, I think uh, myself, I think the coaches, I think the players all personally let it get into their heads yeah. more than they should have. I mean, not that I understand it. Totally. But, but I mean, it, you, you know, at, at the end of the day is games, you just have to have to have it out of the way, out of your Close brain. The chapter. Yeah. yeah. And, and I don't think they could very well. I just had a fun thought. I wonder if uh, I wonder. If, I know the NBA would never do this, but how interesting would it be to have a, a retroactive last two minute report like they do now for uh, <laughs> a last twelve minute uh, report would right. be uh, be more like right. it. They'd say, "Well, no, they're wrong on this one. That one. That one. That one. And that one." <laughs> I always remember the one that always stands out is the late Kobe Bryant's elbow to Mike Bibby's face. Yeah, yeah. Bibby's face fouled his elbow, and, and I mean it's clearly uh, obvious, mean, uh, obviously. I'm a little surprised they didn't kick Bibby out of the game for hurting. Kobe's elbow. It's a very good point. Yeah, flagrant two. Yeah, you know, <laughs> flagrant two, exactly. Because uh, Bibby wound up his head and, and struck the elbow with his nose. And then he went and bled all over the court. How do you do that? Yeah. Uh, maybe. No, no, it's a, <laughs> it's a look back in uh, uh -huh. infamy, as it were. And I mean, that's one of those things that not just Kings fans, but I mean, I, I think on a national basis, whether it's, you know, like Michael Wilbon on pardon interruption sure. or, or, or very respected basketball people that that 
point to that game as as one of the low lights in NBA history. Yeah. And I think rightfully so. I'm going to ask you the same question I started everybody else out with, and, and I'm not trying to taint it because we just talked about a low point, but when 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 you think about the 2002 Sacramento Kings, are the first thoughts you have happy? Are they bitter, sad? What's the first emotion you get when you think about that year? Well, it's mostly happy. Mm-hmm. I mean, because it was, uh, you know, just a beautiful team to watch, and I think it set the tone for the league, you know, a five-man offense, uh, you know, where prior to that, I mean, we all we had was isolations and two-man game right. and – and, of course, we're back to that almost with the exception of the Warriors sure. and a couple others. Who might have lifted a little bit from those Sacramento teams. The yeah, well, I mean, a little different. I mean, they certainly play the wing game more than the the lifted high post guys. Sure. But but certainly, uh, uh, anyway, I think the Kings were clearly ahead of their time. And a real credit to, to Rick Adelman, who never gets enough credit no. uh, yeah. for, for a great coaching job. But uh, it was, a you know, a, a team that was really – correctly put together jeff petrie you know made good trades uh oh i always say fans are always saying well we don't want to be the eighth seed you know we want to you know it's like well you're not going to get to be one seed if you're not at some point right. get in the playoffs and know what you need to do sure. and that's certainly how the kings were built they they got in the playoffs uh 98 99 and built from that traded from that yep. and, and made got better but that was a very talented uh the culture was great. Guys liked one another. Uh, coaching staff was terrific. Not yeah. just Rick, but his whole staff. Sure. Uh, you know, it's about as good as you can have it. You know, and 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 really, uh, that team was the best team in the league. Mm-hmm. Uh, it it just was. Now, having said that, the Lakers had two players better than anybody on the Kings. Yes, uh, two first ballot Hall of Famers. Yes. The Kings uh, uh, had nobody like. And 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 that's why they won three championships. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, sure. Two of which they earned. Sure, yes, two. <laughs> I agree with you hundred percent so, there. So you know, I'll give them their due there. Yeah. But but I mean, you know, those two guys, uh, generally speaking, the team with the two best players will win. Yes. You mentioned uh, culture environment, and it's funny. I have a theory that I can't support with logic, but sometimes I feel like teams tend to take on in in different circumstances the uh, the the attitude of their city. You know, like Pittsburgh. The Steelers, or you know, they're blue collar, or Detroit, New York, and defense, and then you have L.A. and Showtime, and the Warriors, and the West Coast, and all that. And I, I, I felt like with those Kings, I don't know how else to say this. The play on the floor seemed to reflect the personalities off the floor. That I don't know that, I don't know that the play on the floor could have happened as fun as it was if these guys weren't as fun off the court. And I can't explain why, but that's a theory I have. Well, I think there's some, some merit to it. I mean, now the way the team was formed, and it really wasn't the team at the end, but I always said I thought Jason Williams was as important as any player that's ever come through the the route at, at, with yep. the Kings because of his, you know, he more than – even though he wasn't nearly that talented, but he put the Kings on ESPN every night Yes, because he's by far the best ball handler I've ever seen, and, and I spent some time working with Pete Mervis. I was so just going to ask you, I, you I, I know. Pete. Well, I, I mean – you know, Pete was years, sure. decade, decades ahead of his time, sure. and and he's one of those rare players that would probably be better in today's game than he was when he played, right? And and let and players be less jealous of him, sure. But but I mean, Jay Will could do everything Pete could do and do it faster. Wow, wow! <laughs> and now he wasn't near as good a player. I sure. don't mean that. Sure, he couldn't but, score like Pete too. But no, I get what you're saying. The ball, but, but I mean, he was he he just I think brought so much excitement to the team mm-hmm. early on, and everything changed. And so I, I, I just, uh, and I know just selfishly uh, that I used to just couldn't wait for practices because, you know, Jay Will would do something you just had never seen before, sure. good or bad. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, right, right, right. Good right. or bad. Yeah, maybe something in the fourth row. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, you yeah. Alert. And so, so you know, like I say, when, when Jay Will left, I mean, as much as I'd, I'd go to practice, I, I never really enjoyed it near as much because he was <laughs> he, he was special that way. Was Jason Williams one of the all time for coaches? I like to call him no, 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 yes players, where uh, you're looking at him play, you go no, 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 and then he makes the thirty foot fall away shot. Yes, you know, is he one of those guys that you would you would cringe from, and then you know inevitably he'd pull it off. Yo, without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, all timer. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm not sure any other head coach uh, in the league could have adjusted to Jay Will as well as Rick did. Sure. I mean, Rick, I know Rick was, uh, you know, 
probably cringing behind. And I know for a fact he was yeah, cringing right. behind the scenes. Right, right. You know, because we'd talk about it a little bit. But sure. but he knew, you know, you you know, you you have to give a thoroughbred his uh, chance to run. Sure. You know, and and l- learn from his mistakes. And of course, uh, like I say, you know, Jay Will did. He became a better player as he went, even though the Kings traded him. And it was a good trade for the Kings. They got Bibby, who worked. Mm-hmm. better yeah but it's also true jay will went on to play on a world champion as a starter so uh yeah. it, it's not like he suffered i asked uh doug christie the same question uh about jason um do we underrate i mean is there something to the idea that when you were on the floor as a player with jason williams um your court awareness had to be up to a completely different level otherwise you very easily might have taken a spalding off the face like he made the people he played with consistently aware of their surroundings because you never knew what was going to happen. Oh, for sure. And I see, and you see that in today's game with the Chris Pauls yes. or Lucas, you know, great passers that uh, you, you know, you have to be aware because he can make those plays right. and uh, you know, not everybody can do that. No. And, and, and certainly it's a, you know, and probably more rare all the time because uh, we're seeing more guys just basically being interested in scoring, mm-hmm. uh, point guards, so-called point guards, which are really more lead guard scoring guards than they are actual playmakers. And we'll get into this more in the next segment, but I think with, with that team too, Coach, it, it, it seemed like there was such a massive amount of trust formed between the players, and you saw something on, listen, guys like to score, but it truly seemed from a fan point of view that that team got almost as much, if not more, pleasure out of setting up their teammate as they did putting the ball through the hoop themselves. Well, it was a very unselfish. And, and you know, that goes probably to, to Vlade and, and mm-hmm. Chris because the offense really did run through those guys a lot. And so when your top guy, uh, top guys are really have enjoyment in, in passing and, sure. and, uh, and, you know, and credit the offense, you know, the offense was ahead of his time in that, that cutters had a place to cut. Yeah. You know, the basket was open because your big men were raised high yeah. most of the time. And uh, it's very similar to today's game without without any centers for the most part. Sure. <laughs> but sure. but uh but so the unselfishness was there and, and, and that's that becomes its own culture. You know, once a a player really seems to be, have happiness and joy in making another guy look good, well he's gonna be happy making you look good and right you know and i think you know we see that today's game with with the warriors i think really do you think uh, too do you think demontis sabonis could have functioned on that team okay oh he'd been perfect i think so too yeah no I, I absolutely that. perfect on that team. i post yeah 100 <laughs> percent. coach jerry reynolds with us we've got another uh few segments here where we're going to go down me- memory lane memory lane excuse me we're going to talk about 2002 and also like i said a little bit about a uh, little bit uh, uh about the draft process as well whenever you have a uh, an ex uh, nba front office member gm and all that stuff in studio you want to pick their brain in the meantime let me tell you about my friends at american energy you know it's getting hot it was this weather's weird it was like 102 two days ago it was i was put on a jacket yesterday jerry it was uh beautiful beautiful sacramento area i'll take yesterday before uh over the two days ago when it was hot yes you and i were talking off the air we we were not a heat guy not a heat guy not nope. miami not sacramento doesn't matter we don't like the heat no nope. <laughs> american energy can help y'all uh with a half off air conditioning purchase and installation of a full system plus receive a free indoor air quality upgrade take advantage of this limited time offer call today 916-520 9990 that's 520 or visit americanenergyair.com they came out to do a $49 tune up of my air conditioner my furnace uh, just monday and uh just unbelievable customer service on time actually a little bit early but just let me know they were there and, and they'd be at the door right on time and they were better business bureau a plus rating can't do better than that making sacramento proud since 1981 916 520 9990 520 9990 All right, so, Coach, I want to ask you um, real quick about the draft process. You you hear a lot of these stories about, like, uh, especially in the NFL, but in the NBA, too, where, where a player will come in for an interview, and you talked about this a little bit, the mental test, this, that, whatever, and you ask these players, like, these weird questions. I know one prospect said from this year, he said one of the teams, uh, the guy interviewing, uh, asked him if he wanted to have a staring contest. And they had a staring contest to test the competitiveness of the player. I don't know. 
Did you guys ever ask? I mean, were you ever in the room with their weird questions or things you did to throw people off? I don't know. Not really. I yeah. I, I don't. I mean, we were just be, if it was weird questions because we were weird. Yeah, all right. Uh, but but I mean, <laughs> it wasn't anything intentional. You really just wanted to get to know the guy sure. as much. And then, like say, for years we did a lot of psychological testing, which I thought really was was very helpful. Uh, you know, and then uh, to give you some idea, I always remember. You know, like a guy like Francisco Garcia. You yeah. know, I always remember his his test you know and it it basically just said you know this guy will be a great teammate sure. uh, coachable yep all that will probably achieve more than his ability because you know all that yeah, kind of stuff yeah. well and that's who he was yep you know and so so you know they some sometimes that that's a good when you don't have as much information as you used to have like when you when players right. went to school four years and and played actually played in these yeah <laughs> camps yeah. and things which they don't do squat now you know you're you're just really basing it on very little information, a total guess. And so anything you can get, uh, background material, uh, mentally, get some idea of the person. You know, I always look back on, on certain guys that, that you do just had the character, special character about them. I didn't know how good they'd be, but I knew they if they weren't good, it wouldn't be because it didn't work yeah you yeah. know the drew holidays i always remember what a classy young man he was sure. steve steve nash yeah. you know it's like eh, nobody saw greatness right but of course he yeah. was you're talking about the skinny kid out of santa clara yeah it's like people saying well and i i'm you know i'd be a little scared of his body i get yeah. that but he's highly skilled and somebody's asked me the other day well is there anybody you remind you of and i said well yeah uh Reminds me a little bit of Pal Gasol. Really? Oh, you're talking about uh, Chet Holmgren? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I am worried about his body. Oh, but, I'm too. But, but. Yeah. But, but. I mean, and, and that was the rap on Gasol. I, I'm old enough to remember all those things. That sure. When he, when he came in late, people said, well, he was third pick. But he said, oh, you can't take him up there. His body, he won't hold up. Well. Now, I don't believe that Holmgren's as good as Gasol. That's sure. also my opinion. Sure, uh, sure. Just from watching him at the same age. Yeah. But still, I mean, it, it, it certainly Powell's uh, body didn't keep him from achieving no a tremendous career, near Hall of Fame level career. And he filled out a bit too. And he filled out, sure. Most people do. Right. I mean, you and I are proof of that. Yeah, I filled out this boiler down here though a little <laughs> too much. Does it? Uh, I know it makes me feel old. Does it make you feel, if not old, uh, smile that uh, Jabari Smith Jr. might be uh, the number one pick? And I, he, I remember his dad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, bit, yeah. Bit, I, I was going to say that really is. That's one of those eye openers. Of course, I always one of my classic was when I was running the Monarchs and had uh, Pam McGee on the team. Oh yeah, and her son was a little little crapper running around there getting in trouble. <laughs> JaVale McGee, right. you know. So, right, right, right. So you know, <laughs> and, yeah. Anytime you uh, want to get reminded of uh, yep. age is a, a, a creeping disease. Sure is. Uh, that that's a, that's it. But yeah, Jabari uh, Smith and really nice young. I remember him as a nice young man. He wasn't yeah. quite the NBA player you wanted him to be, sure. but but his son. In my mind, it, it's going to be hard for him not to go number one, I think. I, I completely agree with you. When you're evaluating a player, and I completely agree with that, does um, does having a coach as a parent, does having a former NBA or WNBA player as a parent, does that are those generally automatic pluses for you? Uh, uh, does that factor in? It Well, I, I think there's some, don't know questions, some pluses. I mean, I think you see it, of course, with the Curry brothers. Yes. I mean, yeah. I think for the most part, if the parent, uh, you know, is – is the right kind of parent sure, it's not sure. really pushing the kids but just giving them opportunities sure. and and you know for a, a young kid to grow up around in an nba yeah. situation like that uh, they're not as overwhelmed by it and they and, and plus they've got an idea of the talent level right. what it takes right as opposed to some kid from you know crap creek virginia you know that has right. never been you know who, who does he look up to as the best player is probably the best player at that local high school well sure. that that's uh you know and that's kind of the deal but i i think overall it's an advantage i mean it can be you know it's like lebron's son i mean he's had every advantage now can he be as good as daddy well no probably <laughs> i mean, My goodness, I mean right. there's maybe nobody this is yeah. good as, as daddy right. uh, at his prime sure uh, Jerry Reynolds with us. You know, Coach, when we, we look back at 2002, you look back, you, you mentioned uh, 99, 2000, you know, the lockout year, obviously. There's something I'm always a little foggy on, and, and, and I don't know how much light you can shed, but I know you were there. Um, you know, you had Jim Thomas, and then people forget when the Maloofs came in. Like, they came in, but they were 
minority owners for a few months and then took over like middle of the season. And my timeline has it under Jim Thomas's watch that that Jeff Petrie and Rick Adelman, I believe, were brought in, and then the Maloofs kind of came in. So you you had this ownership transition on top of um, you know bringing in, and it really kind of seemed like it happened so quickly. Yeah, okay, Petrie's here now. Adelman comes in. Weber, Vlade, Jason Williams at number seven. Like. I know Rome wasn't built in a day, but man, it seemed like that team got put together quick. Well, yeah, it was a, uh, yeah, just a, uh, everything came together. No question about it for a lot of different reasons, because uh, now Jeff had been here four years. He came in 95, yeah. but, uh, but basically Eddie Jordan was let go at the end of that, the previous season, mm-hmm. things had went bad. Mitch had got hurt and team had just been awful. And really the inter- in, in, you know, interest was at all time low level, much yes. of, kind of like it is now to be truthful. Second to last and, in the league uh, Yeah. And so, uh, but the Kings not only had, had a good draft pick, uh, a seventh pick, but they also had a draft pick from the year before a guy named Paige Stojakovic mm-hmm. who had stayed. So in effect, you're able to get two That's talented right. rookies at the same time. Right. You had free agent or cap money mm-hmm. available because you lost Brian Grant to Portland. People right. forget that. And that was a downer. Yeah. But if without that, you wouldn't have been able to get Vlade Divac. Right. And then, of course, the trade, yep. great trade. And, and I always say to, to build a team, you have to have all those things in play. Sure. Uh, Mitch Richmond really was kind of on the downslide, yep. even though he's a great player and a very unpopular trade at the time. Very unpopular. Uh, to get uh, Chris Chris Weber. Uh, right. And so you had that. You picked up a couple of free agents kind of, you know, that weren't really in demand, but just available like John Barry and Scott Pollard, yep. who were tremendously valuable. Yes. And so – so all that came together, and then maybe the as equally important is the coaching hire, which I know at the time Jim Thomas really was the owner all the way through that year. Unfortunately, he'd already committed to let them loose take over right. at the summer, right? And so things were in place, and so he doesn't get enough credit for that, sure. in my opinion. Sure. But but I was you know I know during the coaching hire it really came down to Paul Silas and Rick Adelman. Really, and, and I always remember Jim. Not that my opinion meant a lot, but he asked me. He said, uh, "You know, okay, so these guys," and he said, uh, "You know, Jeff would prefer Rick Adelman because of his association over the years." And and what what's your thoughts? And I said, "Well, I said I think they're both really good hires." Yeah. I said, "But just on that basis alone, to have your general manager and head coach exactly on the same page yeah. can't be overvalued." Right. And and I think that was, and I think that did have a lot to do with it. I mean, they were very comfortable together. Sure. Uh, sure. Obviously both extremely good at their jobs. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why you had a, an eight year run as good as you had. Well, and we don't, we don't, you know, we've had this issue, especially of late in Sacramento. Um, but I would imagine you can't, not that it can't work otherwise, but having a general manager able to hire his coach, as opposed to a GM coming in or a coach coming in before a GM, that that seems to be a recipe for trouble. It it can be. I mean, you know, like I say, I, I think sometimes when it well, I always go back to a statement that uh, Jack McCloskey, former general manager of the Detroit Pistons, yeah. the bad boy Pistons, yeah. I had known, known him for years through college and the whole bit. Anyway, he told me once he said because I was asking him about it, and he because he'd, he'd been with bad teams as well as good teams, sure. like uh, like anybody has. But he said, until you have a great team off the floor, you'll never have one on the floor. Mm. And he said, you know, thing with the Pistons, you know, myself, the coach, the the owner, we're we're all one. Yeah. And and right. the, and coaching staff, and and so it, you know, when everybody speaks with the same voice, yep. uh, you you've got a chance. And I always thought that just my years at different levels of college, uh, same thing applies. If your president and athletic director aren't aren't on board and supportive, sure. You're gonna you're gonna have a tough time, and if they are on your yep. side, it's gonna go pretty smooth. And if you've got different opinions, and you've got uh, palace intrigue, when you've got drama and all that, I imagine that filters onto the. Yeah, I mean, it eventually filters onto the floor, filters into free agents, and lack thereof it filters everywhere. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So it's uh, yeah. you know, there's no, you know, no magic potion. I, I don't think it's any different in the NBA as it is in in any business sure. in any. Uh, Sure. business you you basically need everybody pulling the same direction at the same time you you they obviously had that going uh that year and 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 the years before and after shortly and it also seemed that free agents or free agents would come here 
players would come here, and you mentioned John Barry, you mentioned Scott mm-hmm. Pollard, and I, I remember you know Vernon Maxwell, or they drafted Lawrence Funder, but couldn't get Jared Wallace on the floor out of Alabama. You know, all these different players. It seemed like everybody that came to the Kings during that era flourished. They excelled. They resurrected their careers or built them. And I got to imagine, Coach, it's talent, sure, but environment also helped that as well. Oh, no question. I mean, you know, people always talk about develop a winning culture, a culture. Right. I say, well, the, the way you do that is win. Yeah. You know, winning comes before yes. winning culture does. Yes. And uh, once you're, if, if you start winning, uh, all the little problems seem to go away. Sure. And when you're losing, the little problems get to be big problems. Yep. So that that's, that's always been that way. And uh, I've always said some of the, the, there's been teams here that probably got along personally better than even that team did, but sure. they weren't very good. Right. 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 <laughs> they just weren't right. very good. Right. And so, uh, you know, so things happened, uh, because of that, but so, yeah, it's, it, it was one of those things where, and I hear that in fans a lot say, well, free agents won't come here. Of course they will. If, if, if there's a reason to, yeah. you know, where, which, which there was a reason at that time, or, I mean, quite honestly, it still comes down to money. Right. I mean, I always say people really lot f- d- don't realize it. I mean, Vladi probably at that time, I know his first choice was not Sacramento. It was the Clippers. Wasn't no, it? actually, it was the Phoenix Suns. Was it? Okay. Yeah, and they yeah. chose Luke Longley. Wow. And, and and so I'm eternally grateful for Whew. that. And so, you know, and, and people I always remember the national media, which they, 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 they're they almost never right and never admit it. But they said, well, the Kings really overpaid for Vladi, which it turned out to be one of the best deals of history. Right. You know, I mean, so it's a great deal, a great deal for everybody. I know that because didn't he wasn't he trying? I, I mean, again, from the media. So you, you would know more than more than I. But I, I was he was he trying to stay like the Lakers didn't. They didn't want to do a deal or whatever. He was trying to stay close to his family. Yeah, that was okay. a big part. Okay. And I, I'm not saying that uh, he may have wanted preferred the Clippers. They just didn't have it. Sure, sure. But the room, I mean, Phoenix did have enough wow. room financially. They just chose to go another way. And Thank and, and so, well, that's part, That's the way it is a lot of times, you know, in trades or drafts. Sure. Sometimes luck is well a big part of it. I mean, Jason, let's see. Jason, Jason Williams, Doug Christie, Paige Stoyakovich, Chris Weber, Luke Longley. Hmm. Yeah, what's wrong with that picture? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll get back with Coach Jerry Reynolds in just a second. Time is flying by, and I want to talk to you about my friends at Open Door. Listen, time does not fly by when you're trying to sell your house. You got a real estate, a realtor coming in, and you got to stage the house and clean it up, and you know people are poking around in your closets. Nobody likes that. It's very, uh, it's very intrusive. Don't do that. Go to Open Door. Open Door can sell your house the moment you want them to buy it. No, really. They you, you go to Overdoor.com. You spend a couple minutes on there telling them about your house. They take comps in the area, do whatever their algorithm is, and, hey, look, it's a competitive offer. Boom, you got it. Cash offer, good to go. You know how much you'll get. You can close when you're ready. You can do everything online. Sell in a matter of days and skip the listing, the staging, and all those strangers in your home. Get your free offer on your house at opendoor.com forward slash my offer. That's opendoor.com forward slash my offer. Offer eligibility varies. Open doors are represented by Open Door Brokerage Inc., license 0206 in California, and Open Door Brokerage LLC and its other markets. We'll be back with Coach Jerry Reynolds. Final half hour of the program right after this. Sports 1140. 1140. KHTK.
Jason Ross. Sports 1140 KHTK. Ah, welcome back. <laughs> Coach Jerry Reynolds. Uh, I am Carmichael Dave. Jay Mars in the other room. We are going to take you all the way up until uh, 9 a.m. with Jim Rome. It, it's so wonderful always to talk to you, Coach. And, uh, really, this week, it's such a pleasure to visit with Doug and, 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 and Bobby and then G-Man yesterday. Uh, and, and it just, I think the listeners, they know, the fans know. Um, but it just drives the point home that, like, not everybody was perfect on that team. I'm sure that, you know, there were people that had bad days or, you know, bad months or whatever. But for the most part, it just seemed like that was a, it was a nice place to go to work at. Oh, it, everyone enjoyed. It seemed like you guys genuinely enjoyed each other most of the time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And and I'm, I, I'll say this. I've always thought, in, in my opinion, and I'm pretty sure I'm right on this, is that the probably if there was a most valuable player as far as all that would be Vladi. Sure. I know a lot of the fans, you know, have forgotten, yeah. you know, what a great a valuable player he was, yeah. but he was the true leader of that team and, and kept everything, you know, everybody's big brother. Right. Uh, a, and truly a good guy. Yeah. I mean, you know, I know there's very <laughs> opinions about his job as general manager and all that sure. stuff, but I always say, well, he didn't hire himself. That's right. And uh, <laughs> that's right. I would I would have taken the job, and I, I have less mm-hmm. qualifications than him, but they offer me a nice big fat check to be the G. I, I, I agree with you 100%, Coach. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, I mean, so, but anyway, he, he really, I thought when things got a little rough or egos got a little bit uh, – um, he softened a little sure. bit. I mean, Vladi would be the guy that, and when new players came in, you know, he made sure they felt welcome and mm-hmm. right away. I mean, so he was a, was and is a special guy. I was always fascinated by the role of Chris Weber on the team and obviously beyond his, his playing, but it, it, I always felt like in a, well, not in a different world, in the real world, you had a guy who was the rookie of the year and got and, and left the warrior. You know, they booted, they traded him after one year. Then you go to the Wizards, or then Bullets, I believe. And, you know, I remember hearing, uh, you know, uh, uh, assault charges or getting caught with uh, weed in Puerto Rico on a, on, I think it was on a, a, a shoe thing or whatever. I, I mean, you can Google all this stuff. Chris Weber had some troubled times and then gets traded to Sacramento and the famous story was crying on the plane. His dad kicked his butt and said, get out there and play. And somehow, some way, and all credit to him, but credit to here too, it's like he finally found the home he'd been looking for. Yeah, it took him a while to get there, although I, th- I always felt like about, about the first practice I saw him, in, and I think just here again, Vladi and Jay Will, maybe more than anybody, he could see, boy, this could be fun. Right. You know, he he, he could see, like, hey, this can work for me. Sure. And, and from that point on, you know, it, it, it did. Yeah. And, you know, and I mean, Chris, you know, definitely Chris uh, was a great talent who, yep. who definitely knew he was. Yes. And yes. Uh, I always yes. got to remember the Don Nelson. I uh, talked to him once about C. Uh, C. Webb. And he sure. said, well, I said, just remember C. Webb, you got to kiss his butt on Monday, mm. kiss it on Tuesday. And for God's sakes, don't forget Wednesday. <laughs> It's always and, and I I feel comfortable talking about Chris like this because we're dealing in a room with two people that that love him to death, and but Chris was and is still complicated at times. Like Chris, to me, there's always been two Chris Webers. There's there's the and I'm just speaking personal anecdotes. You have five hundred billion more, but there's the Chris Weber that when I the when I was interning here, I got sent out to the uh, Crocker Art Museum. And he was doing his uh, collection of, uh, of uh, uh, it was a lot of Martin Luther King and uh, African-American uh, historical pieces that he put out. Just gorgeous collection he put on display. And I had gotten there late, um, and, and, and the media availability had already ended. And I got the guts up to say, hey, Mr. Weber, I think I cried. Oh, can I get a quick second? My, my boss has sent me down here. Just get a quote. He took me into the basement, which I didn't even know they had of the art museum. And he, he pulled a chair up for me, and he sat for 45 minutes with me. He didn't know who the hell I was. Answered every question, and he's the most well-spoken, doesn't do it justice. He is the most intelligent, uh, uh, his, his, his it, not just an IQ thing, the word I'm looking for, he, he just had that sort of, uh, that thing about him that made you feel like the most important person in the room. But then we were on the RV trip, uh, the, you know, the whole King's Dumb RV trip, silly thing we took, a bunch of, you know, the three of us. Four different cities. We talked to him. Hey, Atlanta, Charlotte, uh, come up here, meet me in Detroit, and then no shows. And 
there's those two sides to Chris I think you had to juggle, and that group seemed like they did the best at getting the good side out of him. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, I mean, you, you point out some things there. I mean, really very bright young oh. man, very bright. and Charisma as well. Yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, easy to be around. I mean, I didn't have to coach him. I know he could be a little difficult at times. Sure. But, I mean, just my association was nothing but fun. You know, yeah. he was a neat guy to be around. Yeah. Uh, one of the certainly all-time best player the Kings have ever oh, yeah. had. And uh, I always said just my experience being around what I call great players or near great players, and he certainly – qualifies as a hall of famer yep. but but i always say there there's you know just like i say i what i call the the guys that i really knew the who were truly great got to know real well like bill russell and larry bird and bob mcadoo mm -hmm. uh, and willis reed i mean I, I spent a lot of time with those people so i really knew them yeah and i always and bill even reminded me they said well one thing about about us kind of guys uh, you know the the, the greats and yeah. i know larry would say the same you know there's they have flaws sure that's one of the reasons they're who they are sure i mean they're not they're not wired like me and you right they're they, right. they're wired different right. and uh like bill said you know he said i'm more like a he said uh, us kind of guys great we're more like thoroughbreds. We're not. We're not just regular horses. Sure, sure. It it, it takes a jockey to ride us. Yeah, not just. They're not. Yeah, you know, there's some a little. Not odd, just. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's a and I and I always th thought that made a little bit of sense. I yeah. mean, they're wired different. That's and so that's why they're not always yeah. as, as pleasant as they can be. And and I you know I know that that's kind of the. You know, I don't know Michael Jordan that well, but you you could see right. that that certainly they were right. driven by different uh, demons, so, so to speak. Kareem was also the, the, oh the yeah different. yeah true. I mean, like I say, I, I think when you think about it, I mean, you can look into probably uh, I always say entertainment areas. The Jack Nicholsons are great actors. Yeah, they're obviously there's 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 a few few pieces that don't on that puzzle that yes. don't quite match up, and, yeah. and that's. Part of the reason maybe they're who they are. Sure, and, and, that tortured and, genius type. Yeah, of thing. you know, nothing to do with anything we're talking about. But coach, I love picking your brain always and, and talking about Kareem. It, it brought up one of my favorite questions to ask smart basketball people. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar to me, all around, is maybe the greatest. He, I won't get into it. I, I love, even though I'm a Kings fan, I can appreciate the greatness of Kareem. All obviously, at least for now, all time greatest scorer. Mm -hmm. Coach, why is it that? And I'm not saying it like it's easy. I know it's hard. Why do we not see a skyhook? It's the most devastating offensive weapon in the history of the NBA. And I just don't understand why more big men don't try to learn it. Yeah, I, I think it really goes back to maybe your original thought. On, and I agree. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is the greatest, actually the greatest basketball player of all time when you consider the I college agree. career high school career and all that the yep. greatest i agree and and i mean it it takes a lot of skill to shoot that it's not an easy shot a sweeping sure. look you can learn and i i think uh, i think that's what people don't realize well no it's hard that's a hard shot to to master right. and of course you need to be seven foot one <laughs> right. to have the same success so yes. that that makes it uh, pretty pretty rare but yeah uh maybe the most maybe the most underrated great player in the history of the game yeah you know, maybe next to Rick Barry. And I right. think probably for the same reasons, they were very unlikable at the time they played. Sure. Sure. <laughs> like we just talked about those torture geniuses there. Yes. But you look at Kareem's stats, you you look at uh, all his accomplishments, and it's like, oh, my God, how is – you can ask people who's the greatest player of all time, and I've had people go seven players deep before they get to Kareem. And I just don't understand how that works. We'll finish up with 2002, talk to Coach Jerry Reynolds, and we'll get to what's hot, what's not right after this. 20.
more. What's hot? Yeah, hot. Real hot. And what's not? It's not good. Brought to you by American Energy Air and Solar, Sacramento's complete heating and cooling company and second opinion partner. Who's hot is those Golden State Warriors? After last night's victory over the Dallas Mavericks, propelling them into the NBA Finals, the Warriors have now won 18 straight series against the Western Conference. That is the longest series win streak versus a team's own conference in NBA history. Wow. How about that? How about that? Who's not? Who's not? Jose Canseco. Oh, dear. Save yeah. this from yesterday. It's this an is, anniversary. Yesterday was the 29-year anniversary of Jose Canseco taking a fly ball off of his head yep. that went over the fence for a home run. Mm. He should have gotten credit for that. He should have, right? Yeah, like get an RBI. An there. assist, yeah. maybe? Yes. Hockey assist. Hockey assist, exactly, which I think they should have in the NBA. The Conseco assist should be in baseball. That should be an actual statistic now. One of my favorite things about talking with Coach Jerry Reynolds, and there's so many, is just the encyclopedia of knowledge he has about uh, the history of basketball. We were You, you were cracking me up off, uh, off, off the air because we were talking about the old days of travel. And, yes. And, and, and how... How, you know, it is completely foreign sounding to me that NBA teams would fly commercial. And I mentioned to you, it's just comical to think of these six, seven, six, eight, six, ten guys all trying to fit into these tiny seats. You said, you said, oh, you know, the players flew first class, but as a coach, I flew coach. <laughs> <laughs> they put you, they put you guys, no first class seats for you guys. No, it's, I mean, it's a different time, but, uh, and, and I think, Rightly so, as you point out, the six, seven, six, sure. ten guys. Uh, I mean, yeah. uh, they flew when you had enough seats. Uh, went went on seniority, yeah, and then rookies. Uh, but 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 some and some actually veterans would choose to fly coach because they got extra money oh, if they chose. You know, really? Yeah, because of the players, uh, players association gotcha. the collective bargaining agreement. But okay. yeah, as a coach, and I would say that was in case you didn't need. Uh, needed a reminder of the pecking order uh-huh. of your value. Uh, you get on a plane, you see your players sitting there, and you walk on, you and the trainer, and at that time, one assistant coach, you wow. walk, walk to the back and got in coach. And so, uh, but you know, that was the way it was even, I mean, until early 90s. I mean, the Magics and Birds team, Lakers and Celtics, of those great teams, they flew coach. Wow. And wow. um, through almost all their careers. That's crazy. Yeah. And, and but, you know, and strangely, they actually played about every game. Right. Somehow, <laughs> somehow they managed to play 80, 82 games. There's no load yeah. management back then. Yeah, yeah. It's a silly question, I know, but I, I just, I don't know. I got to ask. Did, did they have, like, in the 80s, 90s, did they have per diem back then, too? Oh. Was that worked through? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was uh, still good. I mean, yeah. not like it was at near the end of, you know, my career. It's sure. like, whoa, that's, that's just. And then plus, like, on the planes the charters i mean i i've got so i i just i mean i was so spoiled right where you you know they fed you yeah you know, and you had snacks stuff you you take off and and plus per diem you right know, i mean due to the league rules i think it was like 120 dollars a day and and i mean and so for a media person as i was for a lot of my right end of the career you know you'd eat in the press room yeah and so you pretty much buy one <laughs> one one meal a day right pretty much is what you you would buy be required to buy. And I'm yeah. guessing Coach Jerry Reynolds wasn't spending $130 a day on his one Jer- meal. No, Jerry Reynolds knew where to go <laughs> for, 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 for uh, uh, Waffle Houses and Denny's. I, 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 I had my places. No, no, no. That, uh, that, I never told Mrs. Reynolds, but that's where she got her Christmas gifts. was, uh, was uh, saved per diem. I'm guessing, you, yeah, you came home with more money than you left on the road trip. Oh, right? it's wonderful. I always say that that was uh, the, probably uh, the, the second greatest joy just about I, I had is see, getting that uh, per diem envelope. Yeah. Now, now, since I've retired, really seeing that, well, uh, the Social Security check in the in the bank, <laughs> right. that, that, that's the equal joy. <laughs> I, uh, so you weren't getting involved in any of the card games on the plane, I imagine. I was not, no. <laughs> no, I, I'm always thankful. That's one bad habit I've never had is gambling. I really just I just don't do it. I never have. So when you, the the famous, gosh, I want to say, were they $300 pants you had to buy on the road? Yes. That uh, Grant always gave you crap over. See, that's some per diem money right there, I would hope. Well, it was, and that, now I'm still crushed about it. And like I say, those those pants, if I'd have known the price, I would have I would have probably did the game in my underwear. But I, uh, but they've uh, 
they they have a, a special place in my closet uh, that uh, never to be taken down and put on. You never, you're never putting them on. You oh should, my gosh! You should be no, wearing no. those things every day. I should. I should. Get your money's I, worth. I should. Yeah, mow the yard in them. You know, <laughs> get my money out of them. Or we could have the first Jerry Reynolds celebrity auction, and they could, we could auction off the pants for charity. Get your money back. No, screw charity. The oh, Jerry okay. Reynolds. Uh, <laughs> the, Jerry the, Reynolds the, the, the Reynolds Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time you uh, went to French Lick? Uh, well, it was in July of okay. last year. My my youngest brother Randy passed away, oh, I'm and sorry. so yeah, we were very close. And, uh, and so so that's the last time I've been there. How uh, has it been? Had it been a while? But I've always, you know, I know you have obviously such a uh, the uh, you always joke the second most famous people around here would disagree. Uh, uh, guy out of French Lick, one with Larry Bird, but uh, I, I I just it occurred to me I, I didn't know how often you were able to go back. Obviously, this has become your home. Yeah, no, this is my home. I I uh, when my brother I had a, a sister that also uh, lived there and and she passed uh, really during the early COVID uh, situation. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I lost her and then and couldn't even go back. I mean, couldn't even go to funeral sure, at that time. Right. And then my brother to to diabetes related uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, things, but. So, so I really don't have anybody back there anymore. Right. And, uh, you know, Larry has moved out. Uh, yes. He doesn't live there anymore either. Uh, he, he has a home in Indiana, but not, not there. Not there. And uh, so uh, I, I doubt that I'll be going back. I mean, I have nothing but good memories of, sure. of it. I mean, it was a great place to be born and raised and beautiful resort area. I mean, it's just a fabulous resort area. People sure. in the Midwest, it's probably the top resort in the Midwest, you know, I mean, with two – championship golf courses a donald ross course and a did pete die pete die course did you know this jay about of french course i did not know you this. didn't know about all the five-star dining i didn't french know Lake. there was a french there was and the, yeah, there's two four-star hotels I really mean, oh yeah yeah okay uh, I, I listen i apologize in advance for my yeah yeah ignorance. just go on the internet french lick uh, resort uh, I just, Indiana. honestly it's, when i think of french lick i think of like a lonely basketball hoop on it, like Hoosiers. That's what I think of when I think of French Lick. I've never taken the time to research it. I didn't know it was a, a, a bigger town. Yeah, well, it was not a big town. It's 2,000 yeah. people, oh, but, okay. it's, but, but still, it's a but it's a, a huge Dye golf course. <laughs> to, a Pete Dye golf course and a wow. Donald Ross course. I oh. grew up on a, near the Donald Ross course wow. and caddied and everything. And then Pete Dyke built the course about 10, 15 years ago. Wow. Uh, just classic. And uh, no, yeah. it's a, you know, it, it's big a big lake outside of town i mean it's sure. a huge resort a huge resort yeah. uh you know kind of i mean it's yeah. like say in the midwest it's well known and right. like say back in the day and i you know when you know people like frank sinatra visited there uh carrie grant uh errol flan all you know they got picked you know they, that it was it was a big gambling thing back in the 20s okay 20s and 30s it, but supposedly the mob al capone uh, the Chicago mob actually controlled it oh, for a number really? of years. Oh, yeah. Wow. I yeah. did. I, I, <laughs> I, I swear to God, I'm going to spend a lot of this weekend reading up on French Lick and the Dude, French Lick Look history. up the French Lick uh, West Baden Springs Hotel. Y yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. yeah, that and then the French Lick Resort uh, hotel's even bigger. I think it, it used to be about 800 rooms. And, and then they got gambling. They got a casino and wow. all that's back there. And so it's, uh, no, it's really very very neat and much nicer than when i grew up but sure. it was a nice I, my, I always say the best job i ever had was through uh, high, late high school and early college i was a uh, lifeguard at the big resort hotel okay. pool oh. and so you know even an ugly little guy like me by the end of the week i'd look pretty good that's, to some of the teenager uh, girls coming right. in there so, <laughs> so that was uh that was uh always <laughs> And I always uh, tell people, too, as uh, one of the th thrills, because a lot of celebrities would come in. I always remember Paul Horning come up there a lot. Really? He, yeah, he was from Louisville. And okay. when he was kicked out of football for a year, yeah. he would come up and always bring a, a, some nice, uh, friendly-looking sure. young ladies. Of course he would. Yes, he yes, would. And, and it was just a joy for us young people, from 18-year-olds <laughs> from French Lick, you know. Right. And, and, Getting autographs, he, you know. Oh, but he was, not, I mean, he was nice, and he'd yeah, always yeah. leave us a little... <laughs> a little uh, few little alcoholic beverages that we shouldn't sure. have had and, and of course you didn't because you were no a, no of course no, but I, I looked said, at him i said well, mr horning we, we we would not partake of such things uh, 21 means 21 <laughs> <laughs> no means no mr horning <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> not doing it yeah oh my oh, goodness so, so he's an extra hero to me sure Let's put it that I'll, way i'll bet he is <laughs> you missed the uh broadcast booth 
A uh, little bit, yeah. yeah, a little bit. Uh, Miss camar- camaraderie more than yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's the big thing. Yeah. Of course, working with Grant was sure. great, but I mean, doing the games as a color it was fun. Uh, you know, you, uh, you know, basically you get upset when the team loses. By the time you're home, it's over. Yeah, and and so you, it's not like, you know, where you just leave it. You could leave it there, but uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun, and I think I miss, uh, you know. Cause I knew all the coaches at that time for years and yeah. pl- about all the players. And, and so, sure. you know, but that goes away, but it, yeah, it, it was time for me to get out. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'd, of course. And, and honestly, I didn't really enjoy much the uh, pre and post game shows. At, right. You yeah. Know, talking about something that might happen and, right. and talking about something that did happen. So talking about something that's happening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And right. so, yeah, yeah, so so, but it was. I was. I was thankful that I I did that for a couple of years. The just the home games and stuff because I found out. I tell you what, I found out, David, that that working half the time, I had six months a year off, and I found out that I was really good at doing nothing. Sure. And I said, I can take this full time. <laughs> I got the skill to make this a twelve time, twelve month a year do nothing. You can win all kinds of Emmys at doing nothing. Doing nothing, you know. <laughs> But, Miss, I know Miss Reynolds was always said, "Oh, you'll have no trouble <laughs> adjusting to doing nothing." So, what's your high? You gotta. I mean, I know you're still active and watching the games and all that, and we only got a minute left. But do you garden? Do you? I don't know. Do you have a hobby? Yeah. Well, I I, I love to walk. I walk okay. every day an yes. hour or so. Uh, I I do a you know a little podcast with the Kings Herald. Yes, which I Excellent really podcast. I really enjoy those That's doing those and uh, and then actually. Uh, Whitey Gleason and the Phantom and myself are talking about getting one started. Oh, uh, that's fantastic! So, so there's, there's that, but but I mean that that's enough. You know, I don't. Uh, please don't you, do mornings. I have kids. Yeah, no, 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 no. We we would we would not Just, we would please. not step on your toes. Start at nine. I don't care about you. No, no, it's got to be later than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be later than that. <laughs> no, no, it may step on somebody else's toes, but it won't be yours. Thank you. I appreciate that, <laughs> Coach. It's. Always such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for coming in and hanging out with us. Always a joy. Anytime. You're one of the best. I appreciate you. That's Coach Jerry Reynolds. He is the legend. He is the fabric of this team. We will uh, we will take a weekend break. Uh, Memorial Day on Monday. Thanks to all who served and who uh, gave the ultimate sacrifice. Thanks to Jay and everybody else. And, of course, uh, of course, Coach Jerry Reynolds. Jim Rome is next.